So uh, I watched the Tucker Carlson uh, interview with uh, Vladimir Putin this morning, and it was quite impressive to watch. I actually watched the whole two and a bit hours of it. Uh, and I'm just going to go through a couple of points which I picked up on there. I mean, there was lots of points to be picking up, but uh, some of the, the, the ones that really stuck out, jumped out at me were as follows. And first of all, uh, it was very, I don't think you would agree, it was very refreshing what Tucker Carlson did in regards to uh, interviewing Vladimir Putin. That is the idea of just simply asking him questions and receiving the answers uninterrupted. There was very little bias in the questions. There were just straight questions, and Vladimir Putin uh, answered those questions in full, uninterrupted for most of the time. Now, uh, I did have a look at uh, the Times and Sunday Times uh, uh, video, whereby they were saying that, hey, Tucker Carlson, you barely got an, a, a word in edgeways. Well, Tucker Carlson was the person doing the interviewing. And this is where a lot of the Western media has mucked up and this is why it turns a lot of us off the mainstream media because these interviews all usually come from an agenda they always interrupt they have their own rhetoric uh, in their questions uh, the questions are really statements and they're trying to put words in in, in these uh, the people who are interviewing's mouths and uh, what Tucker Carlson avoided doing was simply just asking the straight questions and getting very succinct uh, un uh, obstructed answers uh, Vladimir Putin was very straight and direct in his answers which is also something which is unusual uh, what you, you know, which you've, uh, a quality which you don't usually find in western uh, politicians uh, certainly here in, in Britain or in America so that was refreshing now the other thing what I thought was interesting was uh, Vladimir Putin's um, reciting of history put in the Ukrainian situation in a historical context. That is important because many uh, Western politicians have very little understanding about history. In fact, they ignore history. You know, the old adage, your know, lessons have been learned. Well, you know, Vladimir Putin looks at it as a continuum. It didn't just start in like the Western side, you know, Western, or how the West trying to make it portray. It didn't start in 2020 or 2022. You know, it started way, way, way back, 2014, maybe a bit beforehand uh, with Ukraine. And so that history lesson really anchored people to say, well, this is a very long uh, situation. You know, this bit about, for example, Poland absorbing parts of uh, Germany after the Second World War, or Kaliningrad, where uh, Russia still has uh, a, a, a naval base yeah, in, in the west of Europe, sort of west of Europe, if you know, yeah, or near Poland. Yeah? Uh, these are all parts of the ebb and flow of history, and we put these things in a context, uh, if you like, in regards to the invasion of uh, Ukraine. Um, so, that, that I found really interesting. It, it, John uh, Mearsheim, John Mearsheimer, uh, an American academic who has gone over uh, what's been going on in Ukraine, between Russia and Ukraine, for a number of years. He has a particular, he has a lecture, I think it's dated 2015. And if you look at that lecture, he's accurately predicted what the Soviet Union would be doing, like literally, you know, seven years before its time. Now, um, there was an element where uh, Putin mentioned that he suggested to, uh, I, I believe it was more tongue-in-cheek, but he suggested to Clinton that Russia should join NATO. Now, that is fantastic. You know, you've got this whole situation in uh, 1989, 1990, where the dismantling of the Soviet Union and the, the general fears, really, of that dismantling in terms of what would happen and uh, having NATO promised that they wouldn't encroach on uh, those buffer zones, uh, buffer zones, because uh, it was all known during the Cold War that the Soviet Union was using these states, which it took over in the First World War, as sort of buffer stone, uh, buffer zones, so that if there was any more attack from the rest, uh, they they would be fully alerted because they'd have to invade Poland or they'd have to invade Hungary 
uh, or Czechoslovakia in order to get to Russia, which gave them plenty of time to respond. Now, obviously, the dismantling of the uh, Warsaw Pact, um, there's an element of vulnerability, but they were like buffer zone, neutral zones. But as NATO started uh, signing them up, NATO was getting closer and closer to the Russian border, which is something which Russia is not going to accept. 200, 22 million Russian people died in the Second World War. Yeah? So, uh, the idea that Russia would be a part of NATO is hilarious because if we go back to George Orwell's 1984, where he says that uh, you know, there are three sort of uh, spheres of influence in the world, which is uh, Oceania, I think, uh, Asia, Oceania, and I think Americana, or whatever. And these must always be in conflict. Yeah, one must always be in conflict with the other, trying to get um, the the third to be an ally. Yeah, and that's where uh, this whole idea. So the idea that Russia become a member of NATO gets rid of an en enemy, a bogeyman, and that's what the West need. They they need a bogeyman, and they need that bogeyman for the next level, which we're talking about in regards to uh, Western propaganda and and the media. Uh, you know, Western propaganda at the moment is trying to clip it and, and snip it at that interview because they know that most people don't have uh, two hours and 15, 20 minutes to see of a pretty dry protect, uh, sort of uh, uh, interview. So they'll snip it and then spin it the way they want to spin it. But what was good with Tucker Carlson and what he did do, which he probably took a leaf out of uh, uh, Tommy Robinson's book, who he's interviewed in the past, or Andrew Tate's book, who he's interviewed in the past, in regards to taping the whole thing unedited so that you can see for yourself what was being said in the context in which it was being said at any time you can refer to that it's pretty cheeky if you like of uh, Vladimir Putin uh, bringing up uh, certain scrolls or historical documents on certain agreements upon which they were you know, looking on and relying on so he's providing some of the evidence there uh, so this whole idea of uh, Russia being that bogeyman uh, by not letting them join NATO. Yeah, you know, Clinton turned around and said, yeah, that's a pretty good idea, whatever. Come back, uh, be, being spoken to those military industrial complex and people got vested interest in having an enemy and, and had to say, well, no, we can't have that happen. Yeah. And likewise, uh, this whole idea about the propaganda is a bit like in uh, Hollywood. You know, Hollywood, certainly after the Second World War, what you had is this mass uh, consumerism, if you like, and Hollywood was really the shop window of America and American products. So that's why they're dressed in really great garbs and you see these fantastic cars, because uh, you want to buy a piece of Americana. You need to buy a piece of Americana. That's the whole point of, 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 of Hollywood. Well, likewise, with the political system in regards to the mass media, it's there to brainwash us so, so that we feel that this is our bogeyman. They always talk about Hitler, because that's probably the only uh, person which we're really talked about in regards to being a tyrant, apart from the Napoleon bone part. Uh, and, and, and it helps focus that we have the military industrial complex to create weapons which are paid for by our taxes, yeah, to fight bogus wars, be it Iraq, be it uh, Afghanistan. Uh, if we did learn a lesson from history, we would have learned about what happened to the Russians and Soviets in Afghanistan or what happened to the British over 150 years ago in Afghanistan. Those lessons weren't learned because the people who were there in power didn't know those lessons. They didn't study and didn't read their history. So, uh, also, uh, Boris Johnson has got a lot to answer for uh, uh, in addition to this because, you know, he scuppered any chance of a ceasefire and, and getting a, a concrete plan in place to, to have a resolution. He didn't want it, yeah? And he, he's created, yeah, apart from the deaths in, in COVID, you know, he's done again. Uh, the, the, the deaths in Ukraine, over 400,000 people have died uh, in this war. I mean, probably half a million people have died in this war. There are not many street protests like we're getting in, say, Palestine. Uh, uh, you know, protests in pro-Palestine marches. We're not having that when it comes to this particular war, even though it's on our doorstep. It's on our doorstep. 
So it will be interesting to see if um, Tucker Carlson managed to secure a similar interview with Joe Biden. Because I don't think Joe Biden would love an interview like that. He would seek to avoid it. Because when he's asked the question, you know, he'd be stumped. And he'd be going off on some sort of a tangent here and a tangent there. And you would see it side by side, the difference in the leadership. So that's all I've got to say on that um, interview. If you've got time, uh, if you've got two and a half hours to spare, have a look at it. It's good. It's, it's important, if you like. It's a historical document. He's certainly done very well during that interview. Uh, so if you've liked uh, what I've discussed and some of the points which I've raised, please like and subscribe to my channel. I'm, I'm trying to grow this channel now. <laughs> I'm trying to grow it for some time. But please like and subscribe, just even just for a little bit, it's, it's not much, they're not asking for money, just clicking the little button, much appreciated, thank you for your time.